Okay, we are recording. Great, so first order of business here is to review the minutes from our last meeting. And to identify a new minute taker. So Dwayne, you took these minutes, correct? Correct. Okay. So um, Darcy, I think that puts you next uh, on the list. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Somebody is under an airport, huh? Where did the agenda go? Does anybody have any questions or comments? Otherwise, if somebody wants to motion to accept. I move to accept the minutes. Great, thanks Andra. I will second that. Um, Stephanie, do you, do you wanna take a roll call? Sure, um, Dumont. Same. Uh, okay. Um, Drucker. Yes. Selman. And I say yes, even though I wasn't there. Because <laughs> I think yes. we. I, I think, think we need we you. Need, <laughs> we need me. I'll, I'm going to say yes. Rose. Yes. Breger. Yes. Durr. Another yes. I didn't read them. So I would feel better abstaining. <laughs> um, so that only gives us uh, four or two. Um, Do we need five? We need five. Oh, I'll just say yes. <laughs> can we vote twice? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I, I hear we can vote twice, yeah. Do that again. You can definitely change your vote. Yeah, let's just do that again. Dumont? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Selman? Yes. Breger? Yes. Rose? Yes. Durr? Stain. Okay. Great. So that's 501. They're approved. Great. Stephanie, do we know where the agenda is or where I would find it? It's, I sent it in your packet, but I can put it up on screen now if you just give oh, me a second. I don't see it in the packet. It was in the packet. It came, she, Stephanie sent an update with, um, so it came in the first email she sent. Oh, okay. All right. Let's see. I'll see if I Which came it. on the 4th. Okay. At 1156. Okay, so here is the tonight's agenda.
Do we have anybody in the public, Stephanie? Um, one moment. Or maybe I could check. Let me see. No, we do not. Okay, great. Um, okay, so then we can move on to staff updates. Uh, okay, so the first big thing is that um, we did receive our green communities funding uh, for roughly 126,000. That's for mostly for lighting retrofits at the Munson Library, Town Hall, and the police station. And then we also, which I kind of am most excited about, is we got funding to um, install an anti-idling device for when the uh, police get their new ambulance. They haven't purchased it yet, but when they do get that purchase, which will probably happen next year, may not happen this fiscal year, but it may happen next fiscal year, then um, that device uh, can be purchased to be installed on the new ambulance, which is kind of exciting. So uh, there's that. And then there's been more discussion around the um, federal BRIC grant, and we're potentially now looking at solar siting. So that's, um, that's something that we might be looking into uh, for that for that grant funding. Um, I will keep you posted and updated on that. And I'll, so again, they are, there are some um, information sessions that are happening in the next week or so, uh, and I will be attending those. And um, again, we'll definitely be paying close attention and asking about um, our intermunicipal CCA effort to see if we can get funding for that. So, Stephanie, sorry yep. to interrupt. We're looking at your um, direct Oh, not my. Hmm. Okay, you should be looking at. All right, I'm just going to stop share. I thought the agenda was up there. Sorry, on my screen, my agenda was showing, so I'm not sure why it didn't show for you. Um, so anyway, yes, so those are the few uh, grant funding opportunities right now that um, the BRIC grant is kind of a big deal, especially for resiliency and adaptation. That's really um, something that's fairly significant. So we're gonna be looking into that. So I, I, again, I'll keep you updated. Well, what's the grant for solar siting? Stephanie? So that's the one, that's the BRIC grant. That's the federal BRIC grant. And that one um, focuses mainly primarily on resiliency um, of communities. And so um, you can apply for more than, than one. Um, they really encourage intermunicipal uh, collaborations. So that's why CCA came to mind is something that we might potentially look to, but the solar siting is something that could be um, potentially attractive for funding as well. So we might um, try to get like an in-depth solar siting analysis for the, for the town. So these are just a couple of things that are being discussed. Um, and once I, I haven't attended the session yet, they haven't held the sessions, the information sessions yet. So uh, once I attend those, I'll have more information to be able to share. Steffi, if I might just um, uh, add to that, we, we the, our clean energy extension, we have a um, ongoing grant with NREL uh, that's looking at solar siting in rural communities um, and looking at uh, particularly, um, we have three pilot towns that we're working with. Um, and, and part of the grant is really to be able to replicate what we're doing, you're part of this through the, yes. through, yeah, exactly, you're aware of it. Yeah. But they don't, but they aren't, but I don't know if everybody else is aware, so. Yeah, okay, so, and I know, um, uh, Lauren, you emailed me about this yeah. today. today. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which I'll, I, I may have to uh, compliment what I say with, with an, an email as well, but, um, and so we have three pilot towns that we're, we're um, working on, on solar siting methods and so forth, really with the focus as with the CCA, and that's why um, Amherst Pelham Northampton is part of this effort, is really looking at the CCA model to bring in more community um, engagement and um, ownership, if not economic value, uh, to the community. But um, just you know, if if it if it helps, um, you might reference that um, ongoing work um, as well as um, one of the goals and work that we're doing is having replicable models for the solar siting, and we've actually done and prepared reports, as you might have seen, for uh, the three pilot towns, which could be um, something that you uh, could build on uh, for mm -hmm. this uh, BRIC 
grant. Yeah, we can follow up. Definitely, I'll I'll um, touch base with you. Dwayne, thank you. Yeah. What were the pilot towns, Dwayne? Um, uh, West Hampton, Wendell, and Blamford. Um, uh, somewhat random towns, but they were all uh, three. They, were, they needed to meet rural definitions, which I think most of Western Mass does. Um, and they were um, um, green, green communities, uh, as well as um, sort of came forward as, as good uh, partners with us. It's, it's awesome that you bring that up, Dwayne. We, I, Laura and I have been talking about this particular project for a couple of days now, and it's like, we need to ask Dwayne to talk about this. Yeah, and I'm, we can schedule another maybe call or something or Zoom or whatever uh, to do that. And I'll bring in my uh, River Strong, who's my partner on this. I, we were thinking that maybe River was pretty yeah. involved. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. So, just that, yeah, I and don't have any. For Lauren's benefit, uh, Allison Bates is part of our team too, uh, particularly with regard to stakeholder engagement, uh, reaching out to the towns and assessing community interest. Oh, awesome. For, she's my old program director from grad school. So that's great. Glad to know she's involved. Okay, great. So next up is ECAC member updates. Darcy, were you able to find the agenda? No, but I'll, I'm, right. doing, I'm, 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 I'm punting. Um, okay. well, uh, we do, just to let you know, we do have the zoning bylaw discussion as a agenda item. Yeah, no, I assume that we would. Um, so I think you all might have seen that I sent you just at the beginning of this meeting my my updated uh, proposal that I sent just from myself to the Community Resources Committee. Community Resources Committee are, gave counselors until yesterday to submit our own personal zoning priorities, um, which you know appears to be just the beginning of a process for looking at zoning. They're going to have a big meeting on the 15th uh, that they're inviting the rest of the council to, to look at um, everybody's lists. I assume everybody's lists are gonna be in the packet and, and um, why it did not originate with outreach to the community. I'm not completely sure, but uh, in any event, that is coming. And um, so I just, I provided that to you guys just as an example of what the counselors are doing. Uh, mine may be the only ones that have anything in there, has anything in there related to climate. I don't know, because I haven't seen them. I have seen a, a couple of, um, lists that don't do much because of the fact that we don't have our plan out there yet. Um, so I just, um, I'm wondering whether, um, maybe we could just pull that up um, just um, for a moment to look at the climate action list in it and, and just to put it out there whether the committee wants somebody wants to take this on or whether you want me to put something together or what you would like to do. Um, because I'm, I'm, I am proposing and I'm hoping that ECAC will put something forward to give to the CRC. Is, I'm not seeing what's up there. Is there something? No. Um, Stephanie, do you want me to try to show it? Oops, wait a minute. First, Darcy, are you trying to show it? Is it possible to bring it up on the screen?
Sure. Hold on. Okay, so the um, the first ones are about the more traditional zoning topics of housing, um, neighborhood, uh, you know, protecting neighborhoods and so on. And then climate is, um, uh, right there, incorporate the town's climate action goals, um, which I could also put at the top. Obviously I had it at the top to begin with. Um, and then, um, I decided to move it, uh, for no good reason. Um, so, um, these are the, the topics. Yeah, you can stop right there. Um, so it's basically saying that, that we're asking to incorporate the plan that we come up with as a committee, but in the meantime, um, prepare to reduce emissions and create resiliency with these actions. And these are just coming from me, not from the committee. So um, some of them are in the area of buildings, transportation. Um, I came up with some ideas that were totally um, new. <laughs> that just uh, B, for example, required developers and landlords to create 10 year transition plans, including incremental steps they'll be taking in the direction of zero net energy, solar and EV readiness such as those used in Cambridge and Somerville. That is new. And also C is new to me. Require developers and landlords to participate in the regional community choice aggregation joint powers entity as a condition of building or operating. Um, so that uh, is uh, the other things are, and the, the other new thing I put in here is I create food transportation service desert overlay districts targeting increased public transportation connectivity, which I basically got directly from our meetings um, with our outreach group. Um, so I, you know, I'm not, these are just, like I said, these are just mine that the council will look at and say, these are Darcy's suggestions. Um, uh, our list doesn't have to track these, but, um, but it would be nice if we had a list and that we could send them specifically what, what our zoning related climate requests would be. Um, so, comments, thoughts? I'm, I'm curious, do we have any expertise in this group um, about what zoning, that, that understands what zoning it is already legal in Massachusetts? I think one thing that would really help with all of any suggestions we make is if, if, if we're proposing things that have a legal pathway where we're not going to be excited about an idea and then bump into that we're breaking mass general law or proposing zoning that does not conform to mass general law. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, we could also just add to the extent allowed by law or something like that, which I have put in some parts of this. Um, but uh, yeah. And some, some of them might be new territory where there might not be law, um, but that, that's a good, good uh, point. I think if we're aware, of, we, we might handle it differently if we're pushing we against the state or against ourselves. Right. We can do incentives like, you know, tax rebates for meeting higher energy efficiency standards. That's legal. And, um, we can require plans 
that they don't have to build. Um, we just can't require higher energy efficiency in buildings. Darcy, I had a question about timeline because you were saying that the CRC was asking for this input by a certain date, but my understanding, I had a meeting with Chris Brestrup the other day, actually yesterday, and uh, who's the planning director, and I was asking her about what's happening with zoning, with the zoning bylaws, um, and I mean, it sounds to me that that process is much longer. It, it, I'm not sure where these deadlines are coming from, from the CRC, if they're just using them as guidance for working with, with town staff on amending the zoning bylaws. It just seems like it's a much longer process than we're, we're sort of, what I'm hearing from in these meetings is that it's something that's happening really quickly. But when I talk to Chris, it sounds like something that's gonna take time. It is going to take time. And that's more of what um, the chair, Mandy Jo Haneke, has been saying in the last couple of weeks is that this meeting on the 15th is just the beginning of a, what's going to be a fairly long pro process. Because I think they're probably going to be hearing from a lot of people that we have to do outreach to the whole town. Obviously, we have to get input from everybody. Um, and so I, I don't think it's urgent that we get it uh, done like in the next week, but I think that we should figure out what we're going to do and plan on doing something. I wrote to my counselors and asked um, and also corresponded with Mandy Joe and Andy Steinberg about it and um, my uh, overarching ask was to slow down enough that our climate plan could feature into the zoning bylaws um, re overhaul. So I don't know if, you know, they're thinking that long, but you know, by May, we're supposedly going to have some recommendations and I ideas, right? So my understanding from my conversation with Chris Brestrup was that I, I definitely think our process will finish and we'll have a plan completed far before the zoning bylaws get completely overhauled and updated. Um, I, I, you know, uh, that's just so involved. It's just going to take a long time. And my understanding was, you know, that there are pieces that staff are doing that even the staff review is going to take probably a year for some of the work that they're doing, like what the work that Rob Mara is doing to look at where the zoning bylaws conflict, there's conflicting information, you know, that's going to take him, you know, probably at least a year to go through absolutely everything. I, I think that's correct. I think that this, the, that this council is probably going to be motivated to get this done well in advance of the end of their first term. So that, that's a deadline right there. And, and when that, is that, is that next year or 2022 yeah. next year? Yeah, um, but I think that, um, I think it's still important for us to get um, ideas in, you know, when, when we feel, um, does, do, does the group feel like we're at a point where we could even do that now in our process or we're not? I, I was gonna suggest that maybe we, um, following sort of what Andra has, has done personally with her, with the counselors that she's been speaking to, we, submit like an ECAC memo saying that we are working on this plan and that it will have implications for zoning and we'd like the opportunity to present maybe we can present a draft plan at the end of the fiscal at the end of the calendar year 
and be involved in the conversation on how we can integrate our climate action plan into the zoning bylaws. Um, I think because what I what I think this is a great list, Darcy, and I like some of these more innovative ideas. I think it's more. I don't know what the zoning bylaws laws would look like, but my sense is that it would probably be more powerful. Is instead of having an own section on climate actions, these are integrated into all of the bylaws for which they're um, related to. And I, I I think there's also going to be some need for us to think through some contradictions that may pop up. So just from like breezing through this quickly, you know, keeping buildings low in downtown could also make it challenging when we're talking about trying to densify the center of town and incorporate public transportation and more effectively. So, um, that's something that I think we need to spend a little more time with through our action planning process. Yeah, some of these things are just political, you know, just a question of whether we want to densify the UMass campus or downtown. Um, and uh, that is, that's more political than, than, than climate related. Yeah, but you could see how that limit, limita limitations there could impact our ability to achieve some of the other goals that we have that are climate related. Um, and so we should be thinking about that in the context of climate, not necessarily there's one zone about law about this and there's one by law about this and um, to the extent that we could pull it together. So I, yeah, I think that's a good idea to, to put something together indicating that the committee is very aware of what's going on and we want to be included, uh, you know, that we're still in progress and that we hope to be able to um, provide something by the end of the calendar year. That makes sense to me. What do other folks think about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd like that. I also, I, I wrote up, I had a, a couple of things. Some are similar to what Darcy has. Um, so, you know, I don't know if we want to, I think it is useful to give examples because it just like, <laughs> you say climate, you know, resilience and energy issues and, and people don't know what you're talking about but you say you know green roofs and solar ready and uh things like that they know exactly what you mean yeah um so andra would you like to maybe draft the memo with some examples in it all right <laughs> sorry <though. laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, can I send it to people and and get feedback? You can send it to me, Andra, and I'll send it out. And people would send feedback okay. back to me, and I'll consolidate it and get it to you. Right. That'd be good. I'd appreciate that. Does does it make sense for us to spend any time in our task groups kind of do maybe doing an exercise or a conversation about, you know, what zoning is and how how it relates to the our specific topics and get some kind of real time input there. I don't even know if we have time in, in what in our last meeting or not, but just an idea. I think that's a good idea. Land use in particular, but um, but the other the other groups also. We don't have land use here. They're not, they're not at the meeting. Yeah. But I, I agree, Jesse. I think um, even to the extent that we're recognizing that this is an up and coming community outreach opportunity for which not everyone may be aware, myself included, all of the implications that zoning has on climate. Um, 
I think that's a good point to raise to gain to either to g gather feedback on or even just to point out that this is going to be happening soon and that um, this is another opportunity to to engage on the topic. Yeah, I would just add that the idea of implementation pathways is definitely something that is framing the the third task group conversations and and zoning is one of those pathways. So definitely want to keep that in mind. Great. Sounds good. I just wanted to add for the third meeting that um, I've been talking to some staff and I think we, I know that technically we wanted everybody to be part of all three meetings, but there may be some department heads uh, like Chris Brestrup that will be um, able and willing to attend the third meeting for each group. So I just want to make sure that, um, a, I just want to make sure that everybody's on board with that. I mean, I know that was sort of the intent from the beginning, but because we're specifically talking about implementation, I think it's a really important time to have them there. So I'm just making sure before I totally follow up on that, that the committee, that's the committee's wish. Yeah, I see nodding heads. Great. 50% of the building's task group agrees. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Um, does anyone, we sort of jumped into the zoning bylaw discussion. Is there, is there more to that discussion, Darcy, or does, or does that cover it? That covers it, but I do have, um, I did want to update about the, fi speaking with the finance committee um, and also um, the capital inventory thing. So uh, how much time do we need for the niche presentation? Uh, this shouldn't take that long, actually, just to update those two things. Yeah, why don't you give a quick update and then we'll... Okay, that I did um, attend the last finance committee meeting um, to give an update about um, our, our process. And um, Sean Mungana was there, who's the finance director, uh, which was good. Um, and uh, it seems like the basic takeaway for me was that um, that they felt like when they looked at our timeline, um, they thought it was really important that we come to them with something by the end of the calendar year. If we have any thought of getting anything into the budget, because that's that's their main, you know, that's what they do, the budget. Um, so, and they made that statement very strongly. Sean Mangano did and Andy Steinberg, the chair, uh, pretty much saying that it's too late to be putting anything in front of them um, in the spring. So, um, I think that we just need to, to uh, and the other thing that was said was that Lynn, who was also on the on the committee, Lynn Griesmer, the president of the council, uh, said that she thought when we come up with, if we come up in November and December with our list of priority actions or some kind of a budget request, um, that we'll need to have some kind of, um, she was basically saying, you can't get it in the budget unless it's approved by the town council. Um, it seemed like that's what she was saying and that, that we would need to have some kind of a, a meeting to discuss our proposal. So that is unclear. I probably need to talk to her more about that, but she seemed to be saying something along those lines of, of that we can't just come to the finance committee and say, put this in the budget. Um, but of course, I mean, we can, <laughs> we can do that. It's just a question of whether they will put it in if it's not um, something that is, the town manager can put it in anything. So, I mean, we should go to both the finance committee and the town manager because the town manager puts in what he wants. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you definitely would need to get it. I mean, you're a committee appointed by the town manager. So, right. um, 
you would need to run it by him first, probably even before you submit it to the council. Right. Yes. So we'd be sending it to him um, and uh, and trying to get his blessing. Um, so just putting that out, that, that, that's basically what happened in the finance committee. Uh, is, there, is there a larger effort or intention for the town to like look holistically at our budget prior budget and compare it to the priorities of our town? This seems so incremental and frankly, a ridiculous process. <laughs> There's a lot that we do that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, uh, I think that's good feedback to give to the council. Um, but <laughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, with all of the things that went on this summer with police budget and everything else, I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of other towns have their budgets looked at at the highest level in terms of what are the priorities of our community and that feels like a much easier way for us to be able to sh look at and show how climate action and resiliency is feeding into our greater community needs and then into how it's reflected in the budget. Um, and it sounds like we're still planning on, and I know those conversations have happened at the very highest level and in dialogue, but it sounds like the feedback you're getting from the finance committee is that we're just kind of rolling forward with the same old approach to people putting in items and trying to get them funded. I'm not yeah, saying tax is the right place um, to push for this high level thing, but if there's other groups out there doing it. The place to push for it is probably with the town manager um, because he, he puts forward the budget. Um, and uh, that is also a place where we could make that request to look at it holistically in light of the, all of his goals that the town council has put forward, um, the whole financial situation with COVID-19, um, the, the urgency of prioritizing climate. Yeah, I think that it would be good for us to, to um, focus on on him especially. But good point, Laura. Yeah, and well, you know, I can't help but say on the finance committee as well. I mean, if you're just talking about just the structure of things, not a specific item going through, then how it's structured now and the role of the finance committee and what they prioritize is really relevant to that conversation well, as well. You want to get I mean, ultimately the town council has to approve the budget. So it's a combination, you know, you can get the town manager to put something in, but the town, the town council approved everything that was in the budget this year. They can't add to the budget, but they can take away from the budget. Um, and um, so, and the finance committee, it's very important to get their recommendation because the town council generally will go with the town, town the finance committee's recommendation but i didn't see them recommend anything that the town manager didn't you know they didn't they did not recommend against the town manager in any way this year so if you get the town manager on our side that's a good thing So uh, that's all I really have to say about that. Uh, I think that we might want to put together something on that too, to the town manager, prior to submitting what we want to have in our budget. But we don't have to decide that right now. I have another member update. Are you done, Darcy? Well, I just want, if anyone is interested in the, the capital inventory thing is going forward, it's just going to get at the next town town council meeting, it's probably just going to get, ref well, it did get referred to the, to the finance committee. So if we want the finance committee to look at anything in particular, then we need to tell them. Um, 
if we want to add anything to just their basic inventory of, of vehicles um, and buildings, et cetera, then we need to tell them. So, and they were, they were leaning toward not doing anything additional at the meeting, you know, just saying, we know how to do inventories, you know, it's very basic and we'll just do what we always do, have done. Um, so if we want them to do more than that, we need to tell them. And if anybody here wants to either work with me on that or do it, um, we, you know, there's just a few additional categories that we would probably want them to add. feels like another conversation. It is. It is. Um, uh, you know, I had didn't, I got additional information from Stephanie, but we didn't really have a conversation about it. You know, I, we could just see if we want to add a few columns to their inventories and see if this group would agree with what the categories are. I don't even think they're looking at the categories that they have, to be honest. We've talked about this right at the very, very beginning when you all started your process and this question came up. There's supposed to be a cost, you know, a benefit analysis and that's not done. So, um, you know, they already have categories that they're not adhering to. So I'm not sure adding, even adding more, I think they should, but I, you know, again, I think this is another process, another conversation to have regarding this process at another meeting, because there's a lot more to it, I think. Yeah, like what would be our op options for sort of enforcement of what's already in the inventory spreadsheet? Right, so Stephanie already, you have in your packet the, the, the vehicles inventory that Stephanie has had to do for the green communities. Um, so to me, it feels like, why are we doing more than one type of inventory? Um, that seems kind of like a waste of time and money. Um, why don't we just have one process that the child does, uh, you know, either every two years or is it every two years for green communities? Every year. I look at it every year and DPW does something different than everybody else and it's time consuming and arduous and frustrating. <laughs> yeah, so, so I just, yeah, it's not an easy, need, the well, inventory is not easy. Budgeting process and the inventory process. Okay. So easy. Happily. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> no. That's just vehicles, right? Just vehicles. Yeah, just the vehicle. Well, you know, vehicles is kind of a big one, but yeah, it's, um, it's not an easy one either. Getting information is not always easy. So we also want them to look at HVAC systems. We want them to look at um, roofs and solar and um, uh, the water treatment plant and a lot of, we, we have a number of different things that would fall under capital inventory. Um, so. Do you want me to make a proposal about that? Sure. Okay, <clears throat> I'll probably have to talk to you about it, Stephanie, because um, just to basically to find out what's already being done. Stephanie has told me a lot of already. Okay. Great. Andra? Um, I just wanted to mention there's a regenerative food network group of you know not slightly affiliated i guess with um climate action now and um they're they want to uh, you you i think heard about this stephanie they want to um do a showing of a new movie called kiss the ground um on the common and i thought maybe we want to co-sponsor that. Um, I don't know if they want to do it on the premiere date, but I, that's like coming up. 
So, Stephanie, what do you, what do you think about that? Um, in terms of having this committee co-sponsor that, Just, I don't see why, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily see why not if you all are so inclined. I mean, you certainly have this topic as part of the work that you're currently doing. Um, so it's, it seems like it can't hurt. I don't, you know, but um, sorry. You could help facilitate if, if it's going to be on the common. Yeah, I've already, someone's already reached out to me about that and I just have to forward it because I personally can't be the one to sort of um, necessarily book the common on behalf of for them. So I need to, um, first of all, find out if they're even booking the common because I'm not sure they are, to be honest right now. I don't even know if that's possible. Yeah. So I just have to find, that was the first thing that I was going to look into because I was about to just contact someone and say, oh, can we reserve the common? And then I thought, oh, we might not be doing that right now. So, but yeah, I'll follow up. And I don't see, I mean, if you all want to sort of formally say you're a co-sponsor of this event, it's up to you all to vote on that. Have you watched it, Andrew? No, but it, it, it hasn't come out yet. Um, but oh. Kiss the Ground is a, um, a project that's been going on for like seven years. And there's a lot of short little interviews that um, I think they went back to some of the same people to put together. So you can look it up, um, kisstheground.com. And I, I don't know what the timing is that they're thinking about though. Probably they would need us to decide now. <laughs> so, but it's it's just promoting regenerative farming, right? Yeah. What's the main thing? I I'm all for that myself. Is there anybody who has prob has, has reservations? Since we haven't seen what we're endorsing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that feels a little weird. I mean. <laughs> What, what you could do, and I don't, I mean, one way you could sort of skirt around this as a committee, I mean, it could be just supported by sustaining Amherst as well, which is technically what I do when I say we're supporting something. We just have a, the logo, the sustaining Amherst logo and slap that on it. And, you know, essentially that work is affiliated with all of you as well. So it's sort of a roundabout way of saying you're supporting that without having to sort of officially do so. If, because I'm, ha I'm, I mean, I'm totally happy to, I've been working with Sarah and the collaborative on some of their initiatives, so it makes sense to do that. So I'm happy to. Okay, let's do that. Is that good enough, uh, uh, Andra? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'll follow up and help them out as best I can. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, anything else? Um, I'll just mention that um, there's a uh, great uh, lecture series that was announced today at UMass from the History Department, the Feinberg Lecture Series, which is an annual series, and this year they dedicated the full uh, academic year lecture series to uh, the climate um, emergency and sort of historical perspectives, um, but it's, it's it's pretty broad. A really great um, uh, set of speakers, um, some of whom I, I recognize, some I don't. Um, but I I was going to chat out the link, but I don't know if we have chat capability in this format. Um, so uh, just you know, Google um, UMass History Department Feinberg lecture. Dwayne, uh, you can also send me the link and I can send it to everybody. Okay, great. Um, I, I will do that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's really, and it's open to the public um, and uh, they're eager to, to uh, make it available to everybody. So yeah, obviously by Zoom. Dwayne, I just signed up for the keynote today. It's oh, awesome. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is yeah. amazing. If you all haven't heard of her. Um, she wrote Braiding Sweetgrass and Gathering oh, Moss, which are both, yeah, amazing. Great. Wow. How do you spell Feinberg? Uh, F-E-I-N-B-E-R-G.
Great. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, I was just going to add quickly that I did listen to a pretty neat webinar last week from uh, NACEC. Did Jim or Lauren listen to that? Um, it included someone from Worcester, like the sustainability person, I think from Worcester and a couple other people. Um, anyway, it was, I'm waiting for them to hopefully send the recording and I'll pass it along to everybody because particularly the Worcester person's take on how they're trying to implement a lot of, like how they're trying to integrate in similar ways, the work we're doing around building solutions that meet multiple needs and that really help to, I mean, the whole, the whole topic was kind of about environmental justice and um, social welfare building into energy projects. Um, so if I ever get those slides or a presentation, I will send them to you. But um, the person from, I'll try to at least find the name of the person from Worcester. Was that Luber Sorokovar or something? No, it was a, it was a gentleman. Um, I thought I did know more, but I can't seem to find them. Um, but yeah, anyway. Okay, so let's, given um, that we've sort of jumped around a little bit, let's, I think, move first to the niche engineering Q and A part, and then we'll then we'll do the task group. So. Um, Isabel, if you want to leave, you can. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me and having me here today. <laughs> um, so I, I will do what is most efficient and what you would like, uh, or where you think we, we all get the most out of it. So I mean, I prepared some slides. Uh, they are quite a few um, and I, I hear that you all reviewed those, um, so I don't necessarily need to run through all those slides. Um, so if there is like, if our time is all better spent with um, me maybe highlighting some items or jumping right into q and I'm happy to do whatever. <laughs> Laura, I think this is an opportunity to, um, if. If people want to start with questions, if you have questions from reviewing that material, uh, this would be a great place to start. If uh, there are not any questions from reviewing material, we might ask Isabel to go ahead and talk about a couple of things that uh, might be highly relevant. But I suspect that people sort of spent some time reviewing the, the slides. Uh, am I, if I, is that right? Yeah, why don't we um, jump in with folks, either if they have questions or if there's parts of the presentation that they wanted clarification on. Um, and then if we haven't discussed something that Isabel or Jim you or Lauren, you feel like we should touch on, um, we'll do that. Does that sound good? Okay. Oh, works for me. And I can pull up the uh, the presentation slides if that's helpful. Sure. So, are we starting with questions? Yeah, go ahead, Andra. Um, so I had a, a kind of general question about cost comparisons. You know, the cost benefit analysis of green versus gray infrastructure for um stormwater um solutions and it's always good to be able to make that argument that um in the long run it's cheaper but it what what are, what are the actual costs up front is it you know more expensive and to who hmm. Yeah, you, you're jumping right in. <laughs> and it's a very interesting question because uh, with the cost benefit 
analysis. Um, so it depends on which model you use for that. So if you're using the, the FEMA model, um, which is necessary, like if you're applying for the, the BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure Program, or any like FEMA related grants, um, you need to follow that. And so that particular benefit cost analysis um, incorporates nature-based solutions and also social benefits to some extent. And so there is like, uh, but there is a caveat to that. So it incorporates those benefits to, to the society and a natural environment only if um, the, the costs are already, or the, the benefits are already outweighing the costs by at least 75%. And that's probably more information you wanted <laughs> from me to start off with. Um, but it just sets the tone a little bit as to what is compared here and um, what benefits are we talking about. And, uh, and I think the, the, the main takeaway, like when we talk about green infrastructure is that there are like a lot of co-benefits uh, when you install green infrastructure solutions, whereas if you would simply upgrade a culvert, um, repair that, or increase the size of a, of a stormwater or a water main pipe, um, because when you use like green infrastructure, you at the same time like uh, create healthier air, cleaner air, you you add to cleaner water, so you're you're adding recharge to the water system. Um, you're addressing both um, flood uh, flood items, flood um, issues, and at the same time, it benefits uh, uh, like increased temperature. So there are a lot of co-benefits to that, and and not to forget like about what it does to placemaking and um, social welfare, social benefits. So all of this um, can't really be captured in one single number <laughs> typically. And um, so, and yeah, NIT has done a lot of green infrastructure examples. We're currently actually writing a green infrastructure manual for the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. We have worked with a lot of different on a lot of different scales like from like really small uh, scale green infrastructure measures to large scale like university campus or like the district uh, scales in in cities um, and so it always depends on what are you comparing like what problem do you need to solve and uh, how do you go about it? And um, what means do you have in order to, to go about it? And so our typical um, way to go about it is looking at very detailed as to what are we actually trying to solve? Like, what is the issue at hand? Is it, is it flooding? What is the, where are we looking to solve that problem? Um, would we also need to potentially look and typically the, it's not just flooding in one location, but it's like, um, it comes from somewhere. So it's like a more of a watershed based approach. It's more like a, an approach that takes, that also looks at where does the water actually come from and where does it pass through. And, um, and so our approach is like to look at that from a watershed based scale and then um, trying to understand where problem areas, where, where issues, and and also looking at what what is needed, what what can be done, can stormwater be, for example, um, just capped off uh, from running into the stormwater drain? So what and what are the benefits to that? So that it just not simply becomes like this byproduct of like rain, but it's actually a resource recognized as a resource itself, and it becomes more um of a use for for the environment and and uh, you can even integrate it into play features um like uh, there are beautiful examples about that um and and so our approach then is like looking at what is doable at a specific site and sometimes if especially if we're looking at um a road intersection which is pretty narrow um 
you also need to um, come up with a solution that addresses water quality as well, because you have like uh, detrimental byproducts from road, from um, like cars and such. And so you would need to address uh, water quality. And that can be easily done uh, through a mix of certain green infrastructure um, strategies and measures. And in my presentation, I had like a, a lengthy list of like the types of green infrastructure that that can be uh, looked into. So it depends like where you want to put it into and what your role needs are. Um, so yeah, and based on that, just another thought on uh, comparing costs and, and benefits, um, obviously R is like maintenance. Um, and that is typically an, an aspect that is very interesting to um, BPW departments because in the end they are responsible for maintaining green infrastructure. And so sometimes they're like, if you would opt to, to have like pervious pavement or if you have like a, a parking lot where you can uh, easily set aside um, portions that um, that become like pervious surfaces. Um, so they would need just a, a different way of maintaining it. And so that is more a conversation that needs to be had um, as to how to go about this. But um, yeah, it definitely maintenance is a factor that is um, that needs to be factored in in, in the overall discussion. Isabel, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Me or somebody else? Um, this is, I think this is really interesting because I think, well, I had two thoughts. One thought looking through the slides is that, you know, we sort of have already seen an example of this just even this summer, right? With like Fort River having to close for swimming because of high runoff, um, hot temperatures. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, I think that's, I, I think that's just an example of, of something that's happening because we have different types of rain events. Not that we've necessarily had more rain this summer, but our rain events have been different than normal. Um, where I think this ties in actually really well with our previous conversation is like, how could we build green infrastructure into the zoning? And then how do we build the cost benefit analysis that you were just describing into our budgeting process and our inventory process? Because I think what we want to avoid doing is to, to your point, you know, repairing outdated technology that is just a band-aid solution without thinking more holistically about how a green infrastructure project or some other way of addressing an issue could be beneficial on multiple levels. Um, and I think the biggest challenge we have is maybe not the specific projects for, per se, but like how do we build this into our systems that seem so antiquated against this type of of work. Um, the only other thing I'd add, I think, to Andra's point is, you know, I think it'd be helpful for us to think through, you know, based on, you know, there's all these strategies, some of which are more applicable to our area or just specific parts of our area than others. Like I think about green roofs, for example, like most of the green roofs locally, maybe UMass or somewhere else excluded where there's a lot of concrete areas in a small in a small area is just for decoration and not really that that's not where we would necessarily want to spend our money um given that we're not in an urban urban environment you could correct me if I'm wrong but um so like really helping to identify what things we should, if, if we're going to try to, if one of our outcomes of our climate action plan is that we need to include green infrastructure into our zoning bylaws, for example, um, how would we do that and what would be the most beneficial things for us to be looking at 
as as Amherst. Mm -hmm. Jesse, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think to follow on both Andre and, and Laura, one of the things that's that I, I don't think I understand, but I, I think our group maybe needs to understand is if there's gray and then there's green and then, and maybe the next one is natural solutions. And I think there's nature inspired, but then there are, our town has some interesting opportunities where there's, we have both, you know, hardscape downtown and quite a bit of open space. And some of our issues are just at low roads and, and one of the, and I just think, to help us understand, or if, if part of what comes out of this is a, a, a good public understanding of what natural solutions look like um, in our town as far as maintaining and improving spaces, and also the that level of cost, the difference between green and natural, that, that cost in the sense of um, one of the things that makes me nervous is heavy green infrastructure. Um, and even the word infrastructure and what that connotes to people and, and the cost fear that comes from that and how we manage, um, we're just increasingly as a, as a society looking at all of our quote unquote best practices and long-term benefits. But if, if, if we front load all of our costs for everything, I think that's something that's triggering to, to people in general. So I think to, to repeat myself, Amherst may have these great opportunities of natural solutions, quite simply doing a better job at leveraging our, our wild spaces for some of our solutions. I know it's not going to work everywhere, but I want to make sure that concept, uh, it, however, gets in there. Yeah, that's that's uh, those are all uh, great comments. And um, just to, to answer Laura's, Laura's comments, uh, or question or potential assignment uh, first. So I think it, it makes great sense that um, at the, revisiting the zoning bylaws and we reviewed them uh, quickly, um, like as to how we might um, incorporate um, a stronger demand for low impact development and, and green infrastructure strategies for, for one. And then there's also another, um, opportunity that is already there, which is like through the um, MS4 permit that um, Amherst, as all the other uh, communities in Massachusetts are obliged to um, uh, to, to apply with the EPA requirements to um, reduce their combined sewer overflow and as such have to uh, incorporate more best management practices as to where to um, take on additional stormwater runoff. And um, so this could be also tied into existing zoning bylaws and into a new development guidelines and bylaws as to um, that the, the first as like in hyd hydrologic terms where we uh, speak about the, the first flush of rain, which is like the first inch of rain. And uh, so they are, uh, the, the typical approach is that this needs to be taken on by the development itself. So which could be done through green roofs um, or it could be done through um, green infrastructure strategies um, like on the site, but the, the first inch of water needs to be infiltrated on, on the site itself to not add, um, add more stress to, um, to, the, to the stormwater and additionally to the combined sewer um, overflow. And um, yeah, so that's that's a, like another example as to how that might be incorporated. And we work with a lot of municipalities, like helping them um, with those MS4 requirements and helping them meet both the educational requirements as to educating people how they could um, advance this. And examples for this might be um, just simply having um, rain um, 
like rain barrels on site for uh, for community members or um, like how to install your rain garden in your in your garden and so there are like multiple ways as to how this could be done um, and how how people might be excited about this to to do this on their own ground and I'm, I'm not going into the uh, direction as to promoting uh, a potential like uh, standalone water um, re redistribution so some municipalities go down that route um, but it's more like looking at what is already there what's amenable what do people um, what would people feel most likely to to incorporate already in their existing means and it might also be just educating about composting and that um, just flushing everything down the sinkerator um, actually adds more like electricity and water use and all of this. But if you have the space, you can just um, throw your compost um, in your own garden. It's a great education measure for the kids um, and it, it actually helps uh, like the environment overall quite tremendously. So yeah, those, those are some initial ideas as to how this could be um, incorporated into the zoning bylaws and then also like as far as education goes. Um, and so we have like a full package of material that we'd be happy to, to share and uh, like how to get people excited about stormwater overall and what it actually is and such. And so Jesse, your question was more on like what is nature versus gray versus nature inspired or hybrid um, green infrastructure measure, measures and yes i totally agree so there are like seldom instances where it's like a clear cut where it's like either just green or just gray and and typically we we come up with some hybrid approaches especially if we are like in in a in a denser environment or where is like a lot of streetscape and so one example I pulled up here, it's a tree box filter. And, and so it's kind of like incorporated into the existing um, street grid. And um, it's, it's one example how you can just make bioretention and also water quality work like in a, in a densely settled environment. And it goes even further as to those, those infiltration practices we have here where you have like pipe system like running under underneath um, like a densely built an environment where uh, where that kind of like takes care of first uh, the just taking care of the first flush of, of rain uh, filtering it and then um, the rest uh, then it will either be distributed to and recharge into the ground or the rest will be as you see here in these, these pipes, it, it would go um, into the system. So this is this is a very sophisticated <laughs> approach, and I'm not suggesting this uh, particularly for, for Amherst, but these are measures where you have like very limited space, and you really need to um, come up with with some solutions. Permeable pavement is not really a green measurement. <laughs> per se, but it's, it, it can be combined in a way that you have like the permeable paper on top and then a, a water quality crushed stone or some kind of treatment underneath so that the water sifts through the porous pavement and then gets collected, like underneath gets filtered and uh, gets recharged. So there's like all kinds of um, hybrid measures that speaks to that. Green roofs, um, you already Darcy. mentioned. I think Darcy had a question. All right. Go ahead. You're muted, Darcy. Sorry. Um, I just had a question about the whole um, one inch measure idea mm -hmm. and um, how, whether you've seen it applied um, as a zoning measure in downtown areas, municipal downtown areas, and and I guess you talked a little bit about that, but have you seen it as a 
as sort of a, a requirement of developers in new new construction or how does that work? Yeah, definitely. And so it is actually a requirement for MS4 communities like to infiltrate the first inch of rain that falls and uh, like in uh, highly dense urban settlements such as Cambridge and, and Boston. So they are required to infiltrate the first one and a quarter inch of rain um, on site. And um, so which is where um, like it, it either either green roofs or, or blue roofs get installed or where water is just captured and, and taking off um, the, uh, the, the regular process where it would just be discharged. And, and so it's kind of like infiltrated on site through various measures. Do you know if the, um, if the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is required to do that? Are they exempted from that or um, are like would UMass need to do that? Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a requirement by the EPA. So um, all communities are required to do that. That's interesting. I have never heard of that. Yeah, and so Amherst is uh, an MS4 community. So um, uh, you are or your community is um, is uh, required to come up with a stormwater management plan and um, so which includes best management practices which are typically like green infrastructure measures. So I have not seen um, the DMS4 plan that uh, that Amherst has. We'd be happy to look at that and, and help out and um, maybe advise on some measures that, that might make most sense. Um, but yes, definitely you but the community is required to do that. You're saying that the municipality and the state are required to do it on their buildings, but are, are, is there any requirement of doing it on private development? Um, okay, I would need to go back and check that. I am... Um, yeah, let me get back to you on that. I'd be interested to know if, um, well, if Cambridge, you said that some some cities have been re re requiring that for their downtown development. I'm just, I'm interested to know if like cities our size. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, there. I'm pretty sure that it's, it applies equally. Oh, there is something on the web, our website about it. Um, it says Amherst is working to implement a five-year stormwater management program required by the Phase Two MS4 general permit. Phase Two local governments are required to develop and implement a stormwater management program that includes the six measure six measures: public education and outreach, public involvement and participation, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction site stormwater, runoff control, post construction stormwater management for new development and redevelopment, mm -hmm. and pollution prevention, good housekeeping for municipal operations. So it sounds like we need to just confirm that that includes private development. Private development. Yeah. It's probably not, I don't know, it's, it really does need to be in the zoning code um, for it to to be effectuated, I think. Uh, Stephanie, were you going to say something? I, I had something. I, um, I, I'm curious about your, your process. Um, I, I assume that you, you read the um, preparatory materials that the staff, Amherst staff, um, created for our first uh, MVP, whatever it's called, <laughs> the the, first, the planning stage. Um, we we have a, a real expert in DPW, the assistant director of DPW, right, Stephanie, who's a stormwater specialist. And she talked a lot about at that stage um, the you know the <laughs> the aging 
stormwater system and, and how much is, is needed um, for, for that and, and how hard it is to put money into it but when people are complaining about potholes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to talk with staff and, and get recommendations and from them. I mean, I don't feel like we're the ones to kind of mm -hmm. decide what projects, um, but have input, obviously. But I, I think this is a lot of staff input is needed. Yeah, so uh, for sure, we reviewed the uh, MVP report that was put together, and um, we also referenced this in our presentation since it's like all the hazard areas that were called out are like highly linked to like water uh, threats, either being too much or too little. And uh, so, which is where why green infrastructure makes so much sense. Um, and we had a first um, conversation with uh, Goldford, uh, the, the superintendent of the town, and uh, so discussed uh, like our, um, like the, the scope of work and um, like as we're looking at water, stormwater, um, infrastructure, um, and also wastewater obviously as well, but uh, also transportation. And so we had a, like an hour conversation with him as to like what his assessment of the situation in Amherst would be and um, what his thoughts um, are on uh, potentially using like a, a watershed based approach um, that would look at the watershed or like as water is more like as a holistic resource and um, he actually brought up a, a, fu a funny term um, uh, which refers to the, the scorpion bowl, the drink, the scorpion bowl where you have like the, the drink being your, your water resource and then you have like all the participants like having straws and everybody is just enjoying their drink and so he referred to this as being like the the scorpion bowl um, being the, the water resource in Amherst. And um, we, we touched on the, the fact that in 2016, there was a drought. Um, and as we know, this summer, we also had drought conditions uh, in Massachusetts, despite that it rained quite a bit. Um, and so which just underlines the, um, the importance of treating water as a resource holistically and um, that you just can't like take or take sips from your scorpion bowl and, and not recharge it, not refill it, so to say. Um, but yeah, so where, where's the water recharge from if it's just spent, if it's just uh, used for irrigation and, and all this. So we, we, we touched on this with, with Guilford and uh, we made some recommendations on um, like that green infrastructure measures um, might make sense for particular um, areas in town. And um, like another item we also reviewed was the, um, the updated FEMA um, firm maps. And I, I put a link on this uh, to this into the presentation as well, uh, because I thought it was interesting as to that, well, as, as we know, we're seeing higher precipitation and more storm, stormfall, more rainwater. Um, like you see the increase here in, in this graphic. Um, and, and we know that the, the FEMA firm rate maps are just based on the past. So they are not actually um, representing the current conditions or the future conditions. That, that's just not what they do. But we already see um, just this FEMA update on more accurate um, um, location uh, surveys uh, shows us here in the green um, compartments that there has been like added uh, added floodplains within, uh, within the city. So my thinking there were also with respect to the, this might be an interesting um, comparison anal analysis as to looking at so where are the changes 
um, where have floodplains been added? And in, in some instances, they actually touch on residential property. So I'm, yeah, I'm not making any recommendations right now, but I'm, I'm saying it, it might definitely make sense to take a very closer look at this and evaluate like where, where things are at and if there might be a need to potentially incorporate this into like some updated zoning bylaws or um, just maybe an overlay district, which is like another measure that is that is done and in other instances. Mm -hmm. Great, we're gonna um, maybe spend one or two more minutes and then transfer over, spend the last half hour on the task group prep for next time. Are there any other um, questions for Isabel? I don't have a question so much as a comment um, in response to Andrew's last comment about, um, you know, that this is more of a, a staff project. I, I would say that this is really something that um, really does concern this group in terms of resiliency. Um, it's a, a primary resiliency response. And I think you've had Amy Ruzecki, who is the um, assistant superintendent of DPW, at the task group meetings. She's attended two out of the three so far for her group. And um, she's been engaged and involved. And I think if this were one of the proposed implementation items that was presented, uh, I think it would be really useful because she's there and she's been engaged and it would be good to get her feedback and her involvement in the discussion around this and um, in support of this. So I, I don't think it's just something that just comes from staff. I think it's something that is at the very least a recommendation for the town to look at within the plan as a resiliency measure. And, and maybe just one more um, item to add to this, and uh, that maybe just ties into the, the actually the first uh, question Andra had on um, cost benefits and um, like another benefit of green infrastructure is that it's not just like looking at uh, climate adaptation, so it's not just um, fixing um, and and taking taking up additional flood, but it's also a climate mitigation uh, measurement uh, with respect to that uh, low impact development and those more holistic water cycle approaches like feeding back to the water cycle. Um, they actually prevent um, like additional water pumping to wastewater to to water needs because it's green infrastructure mimics this natural cycle and and so yeah so it it has like less electricity costs because you need to to pump water less to as it becomes wastewater uh, and a, a detrimental byproduct so i forgot to mention that earlier but um yeah, you would definitely need to factor that in. And since this is a climate um, adaptation and mitigation plan, I, I think it's worthwhile stressing that um, this green infrastructure can be a solution for both. And it can also incorporate it into the street scrape. Um, so I had a couple of uh, slides in there in the presentation that talk to that it can be incorporated, like even in a when you have like a narrow streetscape and um so it's it's just a matter of what you want to do what you want to achieve it's not either or um you can have both you can have green and complete streets more walkable and bikeable and uh, by that even encouraging more pedestrian and uh and and biking so it's it's just a a very cool tool all around <laughs> I, I put in like 10 votes for projects that do both mitigation and adaptation. Yep. And I think that's where our climate action plan, I mean, I think we've talked about this from the beginning, right? Like how do we make our climate action plan something that has teeth so that then we can say, okay, this is what we're doing. Like, 
Now you need to, before we invest in a infrastructure project, we need to first look and see, are there natural solutions or other things that we should be, that's our first mm -hmm. approach. And then there may not always be, that may not always be the case, but we're trying to flip the paradigm, right? Like instead of bringing in green infrastructure as like a nice to have add on, like mm -hmm. First, this is what we're doing. And then worst case scenario, maybe we're just replacing this storm drain because that's the best we can do at the moment. But, um, and so I think we need to think about as we're working on our plan, how to, mm -hmm. to make sure it supports that um, and supports Amy and, and her team in being able to push back against funding issue, you know, push back against like what, would be their barriers to implementing some of this stuff. How can our plan help support them in um, that? Yeah, right. And and one approach about this maybe just to um, to look at pilot projects, like what projects might be useful and where you already have like a program that you could tie this into. Another approach um, that we did in Northampton um, for the MVP Action Grant was to to look at ten sites. Um, and those would be selected sites, like either within the floodplain or downtown. So where you have like different, um, different strategies and uh, then look at those closer and come up with strategies for like what would make most sense in, in those specific areas. And, um, and then depending on where we want to go, but um, from my understanding, the, the purpose of this plan is also to kind of like identify action items that are ready to go with the next grand round. So that could definitely be done uh, by, by looking at either pilot projects or specific side areas. And um, like also working with, uh, with staff, obviously what, what they want and what they recommend, um, but to propose something to move forward. So those might be some logical ideas that could go. Great. Thank you. This has been really helpful. Um, Welcome. So we'll, of course, work with Jim and Lauren on, on next steps with all of that. Um, and you're welcome to stay for the rest of the conversation or you're welcome to hop off. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I think I'll, I'll join my family for dinner <laughs> shortly. Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> um, Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank I really, you. slides are really helpful. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank, thank you. Don't forget yeah, that. Thank, thank you very much. Trying thank to you stop very much. Screen screening and um, oh, here we go. Stop share. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let Let me know if you have any other questions. We're happy to um, work with Jim and and Lauren. So fabulous. Thanks. Look so forward. Uh, all right. Thank, Thank you all. You. Bye. -bye. All right. So, um, just quickly, um, on the agenda, just want to, which I can't find right now, but there, there is an agenda item on communication. That's something we talked about last week, um, or last time. I think Stephanie is going to invite, uh, Bree to join us for a future meeting to sort of talk about the website and communication and how we how we do all that. Is that right, Stephanie? Yeah. Okay. So we just put it on there since we talked about it last time, but we're gonna have a more in-depth discussion when when she can join us. Um so then let's go to task groups. Um Lauren or Jim. Yeah, sure. I can jump in. Um, so update on follow up from the first, the last round of task groups. We are working on compiling all of the notes right now and th those should be ready to send out at the beginning of next week. Um, we also have, uh, well, Stephanie kindly passed along the poll to help me with scheduling the next round of meetings. So thank you to everyone who has filled that out already. And if you haven't, you know who you are. Um, so please try to 
fill that out um, by tomorrow because I am out on Friday. I'm moving up to Portland, Maine, and I would love to be able to get them scheduled um, before I have to do that. So thank you very much. Um, so looking ahead to the noun, we are looking at those last two weeks in September, as you've seen if you have taken the poll already. And we're going to do our best to try to spread the meetings out over those two weeks, just because having four meetings in a week is a bit intense for those of us who are at all of the meetings. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll do our best because we're aware of some, some holidays and things that are happening um, around that time as well. So um, in terms of figuring out agendas and, um, and nailing those down, I think we'll go with a similar process to what we've been doing so far. Um, where we'll put together a draft based on the conversations that have happened already and um, focusing on the implementation pathways, as we've been saying. Um, so that's going to look a little bit different for each of the groups, but um, definitely just going to be focused on um, furthering the conversations that we've already been having and making sure that we're bringing in anything that we um, have missed that we want to be part of the task groups. Um, so that should be coming to you all ideally by the end of next week. Um, and then we can do the back and forth and comments and feedback and getting the, the co-chairs um, involved in thinking through what the agenda will look like. So um, that's what the next sort of week or so will look like from our end. And if folks have any questions or any thoughts that they want to communicate before we dive into that, um, please just, yeah, let me know or shoot Stephanie an email or, um, however, is the easiest way to do that. Jim, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Nope. You guys should be pretty down with this by now. <laughs> yeah, we're becoming pros now. Round three is going to be, yeah. <laughs> Um, remind me, Lauren, sorry, is there a, do we have another ECAC meeting before the next task group meeting or is it that same week? It might be that same week. Um, it will depend on when the meetings actually get scheduled, whether there's an ECAC meeting before um, some of the task groups, but the first week that we're looking at, there's an ECAC meeting that week. So. Some meetings might happen before that meeting, others might happen after it. Okay. Yeah, any concerns there, Laura? No, I was just wondering, um, about it. Sure, yeah, of course. Um, are, are you, you will note in the survey that it avoids that Wednesday. Yes, I did notice that. So then when I started asking the question, I re realized that. <laughs> um, do folks have any comments or reflections from their past task group meetings or maybe you think thoughts they want to make things they want to make sure we cover in our task group three meeting. Um, if thoughts pop into your head, like I said, please feel free to pass them along. I'd like to hear uh, oh. from the buildings task force how number two went. That's exactly what I just wanted to say. And if I could, if you don't, if you, Sarah, and you, Jesse, don't mind, I just want to say like what an incredibly wonderful job you did with your presentation. Personally, from our perspective, it was amazing. And I've been in touch with IT and they were able to um, section out that presentation. So it might need to be tweaked a little bit, um, possibly, but I don't know. I'm going to send it to Lauren. I don't know. We can sort of follow up. But in any case, we've isolated it as a presentation, a standalone presentation that everyone can use. And it was really fantastic. Yeah. And so we'll send that out as part of the follow up when we send out the notes and um, the sort of save the date for the next meetings as well. That'd be great. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you didn't hear about it, uh, they did this lovely tag team thing where Sarah was talking and Jesse was drawing in these really cute drawings sort of with all these things that illustrated what 
Sarah was talking about. It was really quite lovely. It was very cool. Jesse did the heavy lifting on that for my behalf. But you did an awesome job in presenting. It was fantastic. And and Jesse, your pictures were great. I loved them. I loved your drawings. I thought they were really fantastic. Uh, thank you. I I, I think, to, yeah, no, I, I give Sarah and I in minutes to prepare and we can do anything. Um, the group was smaller and um, so everyone had a little more time to talk. And I think in general, that felt good to the task, to the members of the task group. Mm -hmm. For what it's worth, I don't know how we can use that information, but that, that was my takeaway. It was everyone just had a little more time mm -hmm. uh, to add to the conversation. And I think the conversation was getting increasingly concrete, which I think has worked well for people's brains. Yeah, that, that's sort of the plan in general, is that as we move our, along through these, even within the single meeting, but then as we move further along, that, that things get more concrete, they get more real. Uh, and so that allows people to, to kind of feel them more and understand them, you know, what they really are like and what effects they have more. You, you were worried um, after the first one whether people were going to come back. So the fact that it was smaller, was that good and bad? Yeah, so my understanding, and I don't know everything, and Igazika is not here to report on that. Maybe Lauren or Jim, you know, but my understanding was that there was con scheduling conflicts. Yeah. And, and it wasn't necessarily that people had given up on the process. Um, yeah, we had one community leader who um, was pulled into a work training literally that day. Um, so they were just unable to make it um, for work reasons. And another community leader who had a, a childcare emergency, I believe. So it wasn't anything to do with um, not wanting to be there. It was just ex extenuating circumstances. And they, they were there for sort of as long as they could handle. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, this is one of those things that all of us have, uh, you know, all of us have schedule silliness, which is sort of always an issue, but that particular set of couple of weeks was, was one where like, if there was going to be trouble in people's schedules, it was going to happen then. Uh, so I think that's kind of what happened for, uh, for that group, which was too bad. We, we essentially had no community leaders in that, in that, uh, meeting, which was unfortunate. I mean, we had, we had one for the first yeah. minutes or something. Yeah. It was, it was a voice that was lacking. Although I have to say, Gazi Kaya, I believe she is an incredible voice and representative um, of the community. And I felt like she just continued to do, to be that in our meeting as she always has. So I, yeah. I mean, it, but it was it was it was it was an it was definitely absent and i it, and i i so less has it had its pros and cons we didn't talk about necessarily that topic in the same way uh, which i think is too bad and if the meeting was yeah it's a good point we're working hard to make sure that there are no scheduling conflicts for community leaders for the next round um so hopefully we'll have everyone this time um, of course, there are just some things that we can't predict, but we're going to do our best. Yeah, Darcy. Um, I know I brought this up at the last meeting, but um, I am interested in figuring out what vehicle we're going to use as ECAC ourselves to put forward our priorities uh, are our, our, you know, our, our own suggestions for what we want for actions for our different sector groups. So it seems like this is the time when the, like the co-hosts of each sector group should be putting together their own lists and 
getting them ready to put forward either to the group in the third meeting or just generally to all of us in some context. Um, it just seems like, you know, we're, it's going to be October very soon and we're supposed to be coming up with these priority actions by the end of December. So um, seems like this is the time to be doing that. Other ECAC members, do you have thoughts about that? And if not, what, what, I guess I feel like, uh, you know, when are we, when are we putting in our um, desires about the plan? Linnean, when do you, can you speak to how you want that? Sure. So, um, in, in a couple ways. One, I think uh, that uh hopefully you've been doing that some of that especially in the last meeting right that you were bringing particular ideas to the um to the group that were uh it, that you thought were important and played it will play a big role uh and certainly the renewables group did a really great job of that and i think these guys did as well um and uh and then in the next one, we'll have an opportunity to do even more of that. So again, if you have things that you think are really important, need to be in there, that those are gonna, we're gonna wanna be able to talk about them. Uh, and then as we get to uh, sort of wrapping up that the task group process, uh, there will be a lot of things that don't get touched on. I mean, I, I, was, I was just thinking about, you know, you were, talking about zoning earlier and ordinances and stuff. And it's like, yeah, we're probably not going to get a lot to ordinances in some of these, but we might. Um, uh, ordinances is pretty, uh, pretty um, thick. It's a thick topic. Uh, and, um, and that I think that there will be an opportunity as we start to frame the the sort of the report structure out of this process that there's going to be a yet another opportunity for committee members to say okay well these are the six things that i think really need to be there how how are they in in how do they fit in that framework uh and how do they fit relative to the work that the task groups put together so uh, you have there there'll be plenty of opportunities to to do that both in the task group meeting that's coming up uh, and then uh, in the sort of the next process of framing the, the actual report. Um, I mean, kind of expecting uh, you to do a, lo a lot of framing, actually, so. So it sounds like we should be presenting whatever actions that are on our lists at the next meeting. Yeah, you want to present the most important ones. Uh, really? I think are most important. Well, Concord started out with a list of 200 that they then whittled down. Um, so, I don't know. Do we, are we? We're kind of taking a different approach. We're coming in at the other direction. Uh, that we're starting with principles and key important things and then growing the process, as opposed to starting with a giant tree of things and picking leaves off it. Uh, hey, we didn't really discuss that at any point. I guess I would also just add my, my um, concern, I guess, uh, moving forward is that we also want a plan that we can demonstrate gets to our targets um, mm -hmm. that we've committed ourselves to in the town. And so I think there's a lot of, um, quantitative work that needs to go on in terms of actually quantifying what these actions might result in um, uh, in terms of in terms of actually greenhouse gas reductions which is what we're after at the end of the day mm -hmm. um, and obviously 
and a lot of decisions along the way um, uh, in terms of policy and, and, and so forth. So, um, you know, I see these task force, these uh, task force meetings have been really helpful to get um, conversations going with the community, um, some semblance of, of buy-in or, or um, understanding concerns um, and developing a base of support, community support, which will be critical for us. But at the same time, it's been kind of short, at least in our group, in terms of, well, um, uh, where, where do these ideas actually get us to in terms of greenhouse gas reductions in a, in a quantitative uh, sort of sense, which is what we'll, we'll need. Um, and, uh, uh, and some issues with regard to, and I'm always bringing it up, but, you know, I mean, you know, renewables, uh, do we count them if we don't buy the recs, you know, uh, and, and, and so forth? Um, uh, and, uh, and are we, um, you know, are we getting all this energy from uh, just within the confines of Amherst or beyond and so forth? So um, those were things we started discussing a bit in the, in the task force meeting, but I am eager to sort of get into um, some specifics and sort of quantitative analysis to see where the path, where the plan, to assure that the plan's getting us to where we need it to get us to. Mm -hmm. And Dwayne, on that last note, that's actually something that came up quite a bit in the land use um, task group meetings as well um, around renewable siting. So we definitely have a lot of feedback related to that that we will be incorporating um, alongside the, the uh, things that have been coming out of the renewables group. Great. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go. I mean, I think, Dwayne, you're, you're touching on exactly what we need the task group meetings to do and what they won't be able to do. Like we're not going to be able to use a task group meeting to quantify potential emission reductions, nor Darcy, are we going to be able to use a task group meeting to say, okay, here's five things. Let's vote on our top one. Um, so I think that's something that we'll have to do as ECAC together with Lynn once we finish our sort of the task group process, or not even once we finish, we could start it now, but like taking those, the list of ideas that we have from our previous meetings and our previous work and overlaying them with the principles that we've laid out from our task group meetings. I think my question is how do we bring it all together? Um, and so maybe we should think about what the ECAC meeting after our last task group meeting could look like to really help us understand sort of how that worked and what what were the what kind of what's the framing that has come out of each of the work of the work groups and how do we bring them together do we need to bring them together like what what that and then how do we sort of start that next process of really narrowing out because another thing I know our group really wants is some very actionable um, short term early 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 actions yeah yeah um, can I just say that um, I think that's a great um, uh, conversation for a, a next meeting um, and I need to be uh, leading a zoom call at 630 so I got to jump off let's wait one meeting and then do it because we're gonna yeah. need enough time to put it together yeah 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 okay. that's fine okay, um, okay. bye both of you. Um, is that our quorum? Probably. Yeah, so I think we have to end our meeting now. Um, so for the next meeting, my suggestion is let's see how, if people want to send agenda items, I also want to see how the task group meetings get scheduled. Um, and we can talk about we can kind of overlay ECAC meetings with that to figure out when we would have this discussion and what we would talk about before then. Um, if that yeah. makes sense. I love that idea of, of having a framing meeting, but I, I do <laughs> just, just give it a little bit of time to put all the stuff together. Yeah. That, that. And then if there's specific things that you all think we need to be doing right now, please let us know because then that can be what we talk about at the next meeting or homework we can give to ourselves. Yeah. Um, okay. We've lost our note taker and our quorum. So we are going to <laughs> good night. Oh no, Darcy.
Darcy's the note. Oh, Darcy's the note taker. Sorry, I thought Dwayne was for some reason. Last time. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, I can get information out to the group. So, Lene and folks and I will meet, and if there's stuff that, you know, they identify, we can get it out right away to members. Yeah, and, and some of that has already come out. You've, you've been getting a steady stream of things uh, over the last uh, couple of meetings, um, including a whole thing about energy democracy and a, and the, the project that, uh, that that UMass is working on that, that, uh, that we were talking about today and uh, a couple of other things. I mean, so there's, there's plenty of material that is in your reading list uh, to uh, keep track of uh, to integrate into the planning. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks everybody. Um, and we will talk soon. Bye, Laura. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Good night.